The process will be that we're going to have a, here a statement from Bath and Stop War Coalition, which will take about five minutes. And then each candidate in that order that I've described will respond to that statement and bring in any of their own party or non-party issues and policies that they want to bring in. And they also get five minutes each, and there's a 30 minute, there's a warning card in, in democratic best traditions. So that's it. Um, when we've had the presentations, we'll go into the questions and answer session, and I'll have another little chat to you about how we'll do that then, if that's acceptable to everybody. Okay, so great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nick. We are Bath Stop War Coalition, and each word in our name is significant. We're local to Bath, we want, we, are, we want to stop war, and we are a coalition, quite a broad one, of a number of campaigns working on a variety of topics to work for a less violent world. We've invited all the candidates here tonight for the Bath constituency to say publicly how their party sees national security and how they will work to make our world safer if they are elected. So before the chair uh, throws it open to the candidates, um, we as hosts want to make our views clear. Around the world and close to home, we see, some te we see terrible violence. We see inequality and exclusion that leads to resentment and sows the seed of more violence. Our take on current UK foreign and defence policy is that it actually makes us less safe. Brandishing mighty weapons what might once have been the way to uh, elaborate a, an appropriate defence policy, but those days are long gone. Brandishing mighty weapons that can never be used, nuclear weapons, is even more ludicrous. We need to understand how we've got in this state. Many of the problems that beset the Middle East originate from our meddling in the region in our colonial days, and we are reaping the harvest of past mistakes. Tensions in Ukraine have their origins in Western failure to seize a positive message after the end of the Cold War. UK governments have been slow to recognise some of these changed realities. They've even made things worse by intervening fatally in the vain hope of taking out dictators and imposing leaders approved uh, by us, making costly and catastrophic interventions, which have not only not brought peace they have, or justice to these countries, they've actually led to hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths. Imposing regime change on other countries has failed even on its own rather hypocritical terms. And I say hypocritical because apparently it's okay for us to use force to impose our views on other people, but not for them to use it on us to make thing, us see things their way. When that strategy results in violence close to home, our governments crack down on our civil liberties in the name of a so-called war on terror that has been a failure from the start. The three headline issues for us are nuclear weapons, we undertook to abolish nuclear weapons years ago by treaties which are still in force. They, but they continue to divert resources away from vital research and development that could keep us safe from the genuine threats out there, posed by climate change and inequality here and abroad. We oppose nuclear weapons above all because it is immoral to threaten genocide and mass indiscriminate destruction as a policy. It used to be said that they deterred wars, but they clearly don't. Um, wars have been a constant as long as there have been nuclear weapons, as there were before. And they don't deter now. Countries that have nuclear weapons are no safer than those that do not. We need to show leadership by announcing in the life of the next parliament, when the opportunity presents itself, that we will not renew the Trident nuclear missile system and take a lead in a concerted effort around the world to rid the world of nuclear weapons. The arms trade is another headline issue for us. The British government subsidises the arms trade, spending public money on these export subsidies. We actually fuel conflict by selling arms to aggressive and authoritarian regimes. Our own spending on arms research and development diverts money away from technologies that could save and improve lives instead of destroying them. 
And finally, militarism and the understanding of what real security is. We think that UK foreign national security policy should look up from its obsession with imposing our values on other societies and compromising those values at home. We need to recognise global interdependence and work on the real threats that, to the planet. The shortages of food, <coughs> shortages of water and energy, management of climate change that threatens millions of homes and livelihoods working for economic policies that grant emerging economies the same advantages that we have at a similar stage in development. We should invest in state and civic capacity for conflict prevention and peace building because for us the true meaning of security is freedom from fear, freedom from want and freedom to live in dignity. The Bath Stop War Coalition thinks that our current government policy is part of the problem, not part of the solution. We need to change it. We hope the candidates here tonight will reflect on this. If you're fortunate enough to be elected to this constituency to represent Bath, how will you help us to make a better, safer world? Thank you very much indeed, and um, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to go first this evening. From your website, I found that uh, Professor Paul Rogers' um, talk really thought-provoking, when, especially when he discussed and mentioned the 1945 nuclear bomb and the destruction that this caused, and his views that with modern weapon, weapons of warfare, so much of the world could be destroyed. And I think it truly was very thought-provoking. We can see what destruction there has been with the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and more recently in Syria and Ukraine. Nuclear weapons also would only exasperate the wars across the world. Not only do these conflicts cause death and destruction of communities and also of their properties, these wars cause heartbreak and disperse people across their country and now also into neighbouring countries. The will of people caught up in these conflicts is they just want peace. They want to live their lives without war and destruction. Countries need to work together for peace in our world and the removal of nuclear <laughs> weapons. Paul Rogers is right when he says, maybe we should be investing our money in supporting navies in Europe who can patrol the European waters and will be protectors of our country and Europe. But investing in the expense of Trident. Europe has 23 navies. France is the only one to possess a top of the range and fully operational aircraft carrier. The UK is currently building two, but despite ongoing efforts, it will take years for the Royal Navy to regain the capacity to deliver instant air power from sea. But this is all it cost. In 2001, I was one of 187 British people selected to go to Kosovo as an election supervisor. This was the country's first general election after the war. The election was welcomed by so many of the country's residents they were grateful for us being there, as they wanted a fair election. Many of them wanted their country to move forward, and so they could rebuild their lives. And I was there for 11 days, through election training, through to the actual election and post-election. So I had the opportunity to meet so many Kosovo people um, while I was there. And the reason I was pleased to take part in this mission was because I recognised how lucky we are to have democracy in this country. And I wanted to be able to take the democracy that we have and provide a fair election to a country that suffered war and destruction. These are challenging times. There's so much unrest in the world. And with the unnerving ISIS threats, it's important that we invest, but importantly, we invest in our country's security systems. <coughs> with the modern age of social media and technology, this is where we should put the money. After the general election in May, MPs will vote, as you said, to make a final decision on replacing Trident. Polls consistently show a majority of British voters are opposed to Trident. Protests at nuclear bases are increasing. With this decision being taken in the next Parliament, it's important to me that I listen and take on board residents of Bath's views on Trident and the security of our country. As an independent member of parliament, I will not be ruled by a political party. I will have the freedom in parliament to vote for the best policies that are right for Bath. And regards to Trident and national security, I will have the chance, without a party whip, to vote for the wishes of Bath residents. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for so many people uh, coming along tonight to discuss an incredibly important uh, topic, and one that's incredibly topical at the moment. Uh, I have to admit, you probably won't have any surprises in saying this, but there are quite a few things which I would necessarily disagree with from the opening statement, but I'm sure we'll be able to come on to those uh, later on in the discussion. But yes, you are absolutely right, and I will agree with you on this, we do live in an incredibly dangerous world. Uh, and it is so important that whoever does become the MP for Bath uh, after the election in May puts your security at the absolute number one priority. Uh, we live in a dangerous world. We've got the uh, growing problems of the Russian bear on our eastern front, which is uh, untamable. It's uh, certainly growing in, uh, in power. And we must be working incredibly hard to get Vladimir Putin around the negotiating table to ensure that we do provide a peaceful solution to the issues that are uh, happening over in Ukraine as we speak. Because, to be frank, the ceasefire simply isn't working. There is a uh, quiet thing that's going on at the moment, but it is not working under its current terms. We've got the strength of overseas extremism, which is affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis. We've only seen over the last couple of days the three ladies from London going over to Syria, uh, probably radicalised uh, as a result of uh, different uh, issues in terms of their own communities in London. And uh, we've got homegrown terrorism. Only a couple of um, weeks ago we saw the horrific effects of what happened with the Charlie Hebdo shootings and the horrific attacks that happened over in uh, Denmark and I remember quite clearly when I was uh, working as an internship in London uh, I was on the tube train uh, two behind the one, uh, two in front sorry, of the one that ended up exploding right behind us and there are people in this country who are working every single day to ensure our, and protect our citizens and we should be celebrating their work. We're never going to completely protect our citizens. We can't control people at the end of the day, but what we can do is maximise protection that's available for uh, our citizens. To put this uh, issue into context, we introduced the Strategic Defence Review in 2010 and we inherited a £38 billion pound black hole in our defence budget. £38 billion. Pounds. Just imagine how many schools they could end up providing. And we've done an incredibly good job over the last five years in plugging that hole. And um, what we have uh, looked at is working out the ways that we can A, ensure that we've got a balanced defence budget, but also B, what is in the interest of our long-term strategic needs and long-term defence needs as well. And that means that we need to make sure that we uh, improve our defence procurement and also at the same time making sure we've got appropriate and quality military equipment too. So how do we make this world a safer place? Well, we need to be strengthening our international diplomacy, absolutely 100%. British uh, history shows over the last 200 years that we have been incredibly powerful of our diplomatic record with uh, things like the British Council working incredibly hard across the rest of the uh, world. Uh, a new embassy over in Iran, which should be celebrated, to, in my mind, if we're going to provide a peaceful solution in places like the Middle East and uh, hosting the NATO summit with more uh, world leaders in the UK really gets uh, us at the forefront of international diplomacy and that's something I think we need to be uh, focusing our attention on. We've got an incredibly good record in terms of uh, uh, tackling international world conflict. Uh, in 2013 we were the first country out of all the G8 nations, oh sorry, the UK, <laughs> there's a chat that was half of um, hopefully it wasn't my speech. Um, <coughs> Uh, we're very uh, committed to making sure we hit the 0.7% of gross national income being spent on overseas aid, and I think actually that's a good record. We can go further, of course. We've been leading on things like ending sexual violence in conflict, and William Hague's been doing an awful lot of work on that, and also the, Britain, uh, the Prime Minister held the first Britain's uh, first girl um, <clears throat> conference as well in the UK, working with UNICEF. We have got an incredibly powerful record. Uh, of a history that we can sell across the rest of the world. But, absolutely, again, sorry, I feel like I'm agreeing with you on basically what I just said earlier on, but we do have a really important balance to strike. We cannot continually go around the rest of the world promoting our liberties and our freedoms whilst at home we curtail our civil liberties. And that is something that I, as a Liberal Conservative, am absolutely passionate about and I want to make sure is uh, heightened on the agenda. And lastly, <clears throat> I can't believe after 200 years we haven't been able to solve this problem. For 200 years we've been arguing over whether or not we should have free trade or protectionism. 
In my mind, if you want to end up ensuring that we have global security, we live in a global race. I do not want to see the world end up stopping. We should end up ensuring that we have a world that continues growing and continues to work well together. And that does mean we should embrace uh, globalization and we should end up reducing barriers to free trade as well. If we end up with a uh, supply chain that's an in, on an international scale, we will end up solving peace and security in the long term. We should not end up looking at state of solutions in 100 years time, my ambition to be, if I did that long, I doubt it, but hey, um, we want to make sure that we have got uh, businesses in Bath, businesses in the rest of um, the UK with the security and the protection that is uh, appropriate to those, and the only way that we can do that is by working on an international free trade basis. So, I haven't touched on Trident, and I know you're probably going to ask me loads of questions on that, so I won't uh, talk about that right now, but please feel free to ask me any questions on any subjects you've got in the coming minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, so first, you, um, first of all, sorry, thank you very much for inviting me along tonight, as always, at the Friends Meeting House, another fantastic turnout. Um, and I really just wanted to use this opportunity to respond directly um, to Stop the War Coalition's um, agenda. And I personally um, welcome the fantastic work um, done by um, Stop the War Coalition. Um, I mean, my, my personal belief is that war should always be a last resort. However, I also think it's helpful to recognise the positive work done by our military forces as well, certainly in terms of our peacekeeping role in the world. And um, particularly though, um, Stop the War Coalition obviously um, promotes cooperation and trust, and this is something that I fully support. And I think it's vital that we continue to work within the international community to maximise cooperation and trust, and that we should use our position within the international community to promote this diplomacy and non-violent means of action. Now, as a party, our, our, um, our, our policy, our, our, our policy can be summed up in three words, pragmatic, progressive, and internationalist. So, um, I, I look forward to going into more depth later on, and I look forward to responding to your questions. So, thank you very much. spent the last two hours fighting with my printer and I'm afraid I'm going to have to read my speech off the laptop. I'm in no means a, a technical whiz. Don't be thinking this is a, a very top of technology. It's simply a case of somebody who's uh, fought and lost against a printer. Um, so apologies for what will probably be a, a less than smooth presentation. Um, I think it's fair to say that throughout history, I mean, sadly, one of the consistent elements of humanity has been uh, the continual presence of conflict. Uh, I mean, some would say it's always been that way before, and therefore it will always be that way in the future. Uh, as, as Greek philosopher Plato put it, uh, over 2,000 years ago, only the dead have seen the end of war. But at the same time, there can be absolutely no doubt the last 75 years have seen uh, conflict in our world reduced considerably. No longer do we have vast arrays of nations stretching the whole width of the world engaged in massive conflict with each other. But has that made our world really any safer? And what is it that actually makes the world safer in the first place? Uh, briefly, from my own perspective, um, I probably bring a bit of a unique insight in some ways to this debate uh, for two particular reasons. Um, firstly, I was born and bred in Northern Ireland, the Troubles. Um, for the first 19 years of my life, before I moved to Bath, I grew up in a society where conflict was a day-to-day -day occurrence, where bombings and shootings, shootings were, not common, were, were not uncommon, where military vehicles and uniformed soldiers reach you literally every day of your life. And that experience has given me an important insight into the causes of conflict and some solutions as well, and something I hope to touch on a bit later on. Uh, uh, when I came over to Bath, obviously being from Northern Ireland, I had a big interest in politics, but the second, I guess, perspective that I'd like to raise personally is a trigger point for why I got involved in politics. I had a normal life until 2003. And in 2003, the Iraq War happened. And probably like many of you, on that really wet, cold, miserable February day in 2003, myself and over a million other people went out in the streets of London and said this war is wrong, <laughs> it can't happen, it shouldn't happen. 
I was inspired by the number of people who went out and stand to agree with me on that, and I was absolutely distraught when our country still went to war and we're still seeing the disastrous consequences unfolding now. And that was the point at which, in a similar moment in my life, I decided, perhaps naively, I would get involved in politics to try to do something about that. And I chose the Liberal Democrats as the largest party in Parliament who said then, and still say now, that war was wrong. So, to understand the question of what makes the world safer, it's probably easier to quickly look at what makes it less safe. And um, there seem to be maybe three recurring themes in this. The first one is conflict does not happen in a vacuum. I do not believe individuals, nations, want to engage in conflict for no particular reason. There's always some sort of underlying reason. And usually, it's some sort of grievance which has been ignored and has been allowed to fester for a long time. We saw it in Northern Ireland, we see it in Israel Palestine today, we've seen it more recently in Iraq. Um, and in particular, we're seeing grievances continuing to provide oxygen for conflict, for terrorism, and for extremist groups. And I am absolutely convinced that until we tackle, in a positive and peaceful way, the Arab Israeli situation, we have no chance of stopping Islamic extremism. Now, before we move on, to, on, on from this particular issue as well, I want to raise another important factor. Um, I agree with what Ben said earlier on, the world is a dangerous place. I probably disagree with them for why it is. Um, I don't personally believe the biggest threat to our world is the economy or terrorism or security. I think genuinely the serious biggest threat mankind faces is climate change. And I believe that that, that is currently and will increasingly be at the root of a growing series of events which will make our world less safe. And it's something that, if, if like me, you believe that, that is the case, then in spite of what the government, the country, and all nations take climate change seriously as a way of ensuring we live in a less dangerous society, uh, world. Secondly, military power does not make us safer. And it should be an absolute last resort. It gives, military power gives nations a blunt tool to engage with issues when they arise for a short period of time. It also has a positive role humanitarianly, but it does not make us safer. And we'll touch on some reasons for that later on, and particularly the grounds on which the Liberal Democrats would believe as a last resort this country should engage in military intervention. And finally, I think the, the, the third way to make this world safer is to bring nations closer together, whether that's through trade, through international organisations, and again, that's something we can touch on a bit later on. But you do not go to war with your friends, you do not go to war with nations you need to work with. So, in summary, as I said, I don't believe that uh, conflict happens in a vacuum. I don't believe that military might uh, is anything apart from a last resort, and I think we need to work more closely together. And I'm an internationalist to ensure we can do everything we can to draw citizens and nations together to make conflict less likely to happen. Thank you for your time, and apologies for the rather unorthodox presentation style. Now, what we're going to have this evening is a bit of a variety of different opinions and perspectives. But um, one of the things that I think we will all agree on is that none of us want war, do we? And it's um, one of those situations that um, you know, we're all going to disagree, probably, or there's going to be much disagreement as to how we get to that situation. But I don't think anybody would ever put their hand up here and say yes. I want a war. For example, Steve mentions the, uh, the massive um, demonstrations against the Iraq war. A million people. You know, how many times do you see citizens of the country protesting in favour of war? You know, war is not something that the people bring about. It's brought about by governments. Now, we do have a bit of an interesting situation going on, don't we? Because within these events and within these hustings, we often see Politicians will stand up and, you know, just like me, they'll say how opposed to war they are. They'll even attend demonstrations opposing war. But we've all seen what happens, haven't we? When politicians are parts of governments, when they're whipped, what do they do? <coughs> Hundreds of our MPs vote in favour of going to war in foreign conflicts that have been futile and not ended very nicely, and in some cases continue to um, go on. Our own MP here in Bath was very vocal about the Iraq war. But then, more recently, he voted with the government in favour of military action in Syria. And thank God 
by a very narrow margin. Parliament voted not to do that. Now, I'm very, very privileged and I have personally never, ever seen the horrors of war. But as a little hobby of mine, I, um, I do a bit of parachuting at a military um, outfit over in uh, Wiltshire. And there was a day that I was there and I saw 12 men sat around in a circle, or they were lying around in a circle, all talking. And all 12 of them had limbs missing. They'd all taken up parachuting with prosthetic limbs that they'd had to buy themselves out of their own money. Now, you know, when these men signed up to the military, they were prepared to die in the defence of their nation. What they weren't prepared to do was become mutilated in the name of futile foreign wars that benefit absolutely nobody. So, you know, my position on this is very similar to the position of my party, UKIP. You know, we do believe in having a fully resourced military that is a defence, you know, not an attack. In relation to our nuclear capabilities, the, uh, the UKIP policy hasn't been published on this yet, but I can tell you what it's roughly going to be. You know, I'm not going to hide that. We are in favour of maintaining a nuclear deterrent after um, Trident expires. So, you know, one thing I would say is that the, in terms of how to make the world safer, I don't think that in Britain our government is doing a very good job of that. And you only have to turn on the television and look around you to see all of these situations that are going on at the moment, you know, with ISIS, with Russia. You know, Russia for heaven's sake. How did we get here? You know, we're clearly failing. To, uh, you know, to, to get this right. And um, the results of these wars speak for themselves. So um, I'll leave it there at the moment and let's have a good discussion. Thank you. I'm not going to spend um, much time talking about how terrible war is. Of course, it's terrible. I think everyone in this panel agrees that it sounds like we do. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, what do we do to make the world more, uh, a more secure place? Do we uh, have weapons we can threaten people with, a uh, military we can threaten people with, or do we try and work with people? Now, it was said that the EU was set up, I know it's not universally popular, and um, don't get me wrong, I have many issues with the EU, but one thing it has done is given us peace in Europe. Now, the EU and Europe in general, there's, there is a, 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 cooperative, a cooperative group of, uh, within Europe called, I uh, forget the acronym offhand, I think it's the Organisation of Form. Yes, that's the one. Um, now, that exists as a group which works, it's actually, actually not part of the EU, it's just European nations. That's the sort of thing we should be doing. As a party, we actually don't think that nations should have unilaterally. Everything should happen through the UN or, other, or a wider sort of group of nations. Now, history has shown that that is a much more successful way to keep peace in the world. But, obviously, we have to back this up with policy. What is our policy? I mean, I'm not afraid to say what our policy is, and I will say right now that we are, um, I think, the only party that will, that will not only not renew Trident, but we will immediately decommission any nuclear weapons uh, on election. Um, we don't think there is any moral case for nuclear weapons. They're tactically useless, massively expensive, and just immoral to use. Nobody would, no sane leader would ever use them. What are our policies on other parts of the military? Well, you may have heard, we've been, we've been misquoted. That, uh, people say we want to dis dismantle the military entirely. That's just simply not true. Um, obviously, we need a military. Uh, you need some sort of defence capability, and also you need some sort of anti-terrorism capability. This is a sad truth in this world. But what we would do is actually remove any offensive capability from our military. And if what we do have, we would put it into an international force. Whereas, where whatever our government says and whoever we want to attack, it would have to always have the backing of the UN or somebody similar. Um, the UN has its issues. The, um, well, the Europe has its issues. And one of our biggest problems with the, with the um, UN is the Security Council, which we don't think we should be in. 
you know, should be a security council, it's not democratic. So all these things, the, the, what looks after security in the world is anti-democratic and actually geared towards people who happen to have won the Second World War. That's not a way to continue um, security in this world. Of course nations are going to start feeling that that's unfair. The best way to make sure that people don't develop offensive capability and nuclear weapons is to actually make sure that there is nobody they feel they have to have those weapons to counter. Unilateral does disarm whereas it might not sound like a rational um, position, is actually the best way and the only way to get other countries to disarm. Because as long as we've got nuclear weapons, and as long as other people have got nuclear weapons, if you were Iran, then you'd probably want nuclear weapons. What incentive do you have to, uh, do you have to not use them? So, I'm going to just get quickly on to terrorism, because obviously the main threat to our state is actually an invasion by a military force. It's possibly uh, what people consider terrorist threats, um, homegrown and otherwise. What's the best way to stop that? The best way to stop that is to take away the people, people's reason to actually become terrorists in the first place. We don't do that by bombing them. We do that by finding out why they have these issues and actually trying to counter them. We can counter them with foreign aid. We can counter them by stopping interference in their, policy, in their countries. Um, there is a role for interference, and I said in inverted commas, in that yes, we should see what issues people have and help them as much as we can. But what we don't do is dictate what sort of government they should have, and when they don't do what we like, we don't attack them. This is obviously going to end in just an endless cycle of violence. So hopefully in, this, uh, in the coming questions we can, I can explain what we would do to stop that happening and make the world a safer place. Thank you. Now then, it's question time. Dominic, this question is you. Do you not think it's NATO that kept the peace in Europe and not Europe? Because after all, it was only when the Americans became involved in Yugoslavia that the war came to an end. Um, sorry, um, do I need the microphone or is that never hear me? I'll wait. It's a bit sharp with the mic. Yeah. Um, you're probably right. and. I say that actually, as a party we actually want to um, leave NATO, and we don't agree with NATO. But let me, let me just um, explain why. Um, Europe could have had a much more active role if NATO hadn't been there. We have uh, a tendency in Europe to depend on America, because America has such, huge, you know, such a huge military spend. Um, there is less incentive for European nations to spend on the military. Now, as somebody who doesn't like military spending to be, you'd have thought I'd be a big fan of that. Um, but actually, I think Europe should be much more able to look after itself and not have to depend on America. Now, historically, yes, NATO has kept the peace, and I'm not going to deny that. But moving forward, I think Europe should take that role. And to some extent, it has, uh, you know, because there's such interdependence within Europe that most nations wouldn't want to attack each other. We're just too closely, I mean, never say never, right? But um, compared to his, you know, his, in history, it has been much more violent in Europe. Um, now we've had a, a period of relative peace. You can never predict the future. But if everyone in Europe, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of a, of a European army. Um, that might not be a popular thing for some people, but actually, if you have lots of nation states all spending lots of money on lots of, you know, there's lots of one-up and shit, America, as an army, you know, it's completely different to Europe, but it's big and actually very different to each other. But there is, they are united behind a common cause when it comes to a uh, military. Now, people think, oh, Europe, that would never happen, but that's just a mindset. We've got to change that mindset because actually, if there is a war, we're, it's very, it's going to be a very, very bad war. So let's try and avoid that at all costs. Mr. Lorraine, do you want to have a word? Your question is right, actually, about NATO. I saw that in Kosovo when we were there, um, and it was then peacetime. The armies were the army forces that were there were from all over the world. They were brought in by NATO. Also, police forces from across the world were there supporting Kosovo through the transition of this terrible, terrible war that they'd had 
through to them having a peaceful, peaceful time. And I saw that firsthand. In fact, um, our polling stations, my polling station and the other polling stations, were actually, um, uh, the security were from forces from all over the world looking after us. So you're very right, NATO had, had a big part in helping a lot of those wars um, come to peace. Thank you. This is bringing in a lot of views from the panel on NATO. Just very, very briefly, just to pick up on something that Dominic said about going for a, a European um, military as opposed to nation state militaries. Um, you know, Dominic will be pleased to hear that, that is kind of happening already. You know, when we had the opening of the European Parliament, we saw um, a number of soldiers wearing a uniform that nobody recognised. You can see that the scale and the spending of our own national military is decreasing by quite a significant amount every single year, while the spending um, of you know, the, the European military capability. So, so don't be in any doubt that that is where we are heading. It's part of this European dream, as some people would call it, or nightmare, as I would call it. Um, you know, Dominic's wish will um, ultimately come true as long as this European project continues. So, um, so that's, that's, that's where we are in that situation. Um, there is one country that 20 years ago did disarm nuclearly, nuclearly and that is Ukraine. And of course, um, I'm thinking about it, I think about the implications of that. And the reason that, nuclear, that Ukraine disarmed nuclearly, I don't like that word, but I'll continue using it, um, is that it, it bothered Moscow that the nuclear weapons were, were in a, a supposedly independent country after the end of the Warsaw Pact. I suspect that if we do leave NATO, the Washington won't care for the fact that we have nuclear weapons anymore, and we, and we will have to give them up anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're, you're absolutely right. Um, for, for, for anyone who doesn't know the situation, when the Soviet Union um, dissolved in 1991, a third of, of the, the previous Soviet Union's arsenal and a lot of its design and production capability was in Ukraine. And in 1994, an agreement was brokered between uh, Russia, the UK, the US, and I think it was with the EU. And so we got the Budapest Agreement. And it was a very clear agreement where, in return for giving up that nuclear arsenal, uh, Ukraine was given a guarantee that its territori territorial sovereignty would be protected and respected. Fast forward, uh, 20 years, and we've seen that that just did not happen. The opposite happened. Ukraine has lost a, a million of its citizens and a very sizable chunk of its territory. So think for a second, any other country which is in possession of nuclear weapons either now or may find itself in the future, will they take seriously any promises of support if they're asked to disarm in the future? Um, so that's on Ukraine. And very briefly, I wanted to mention something because I hope we'll get asked the question or try to at some stage. And just in case we don't, sometimes you don't always get the questions you, you like in hostings. Well, okay. Uh, somebody please ask a question about the at some stage. So I'm busy writing the right questions on Trident there. Uh, you've hit the nail on the head, to be honest with you. Britain is batting above its weight. We're a small island nation in the big scheme of things off the coast of Europe. If Britain didn't have uh, nuclear weapons uh, at the moment, we would, uh, to be frank, have a very insecure position on the UN Security Council and our position as a global leader and having clout on being able to deal with a number of different issues, whether that be on a unilateral, bilateral, whichever type of lateral uh, basis, would be completely uh, uh, impinged. So, yes, we, I think we all agree, I think we all agree, that we want to see total nuclear disarmament. I think there's no doubt of that. We want to see total uh, removal of weapons of mass destruction, as we've been the hot topic of uh, the last 20 years. We want to see removal of biological and chemical weapons, absolutely. There's no doubt about that at all. However, the big problem is, over the last 50 years, using the UN model, no one has been willing to take that first step. And the times when we've been able to actually reduce the amount of nuclear weapons is when we've worked on an international basis and worked uh, with our partners across the rest of the world. Now, at the moment, I do not see any way possible 
that if Britain did what the Green Party have said and say, right, we will make that first step, we will give away our nuclear weapons, we will become a nuclear-free country, that Britain's position would be secure in the rest of the world because, to be frank, we would be a laughing stock amongst our main uh, partner, the, 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 the uh, country that's uh, paying for our defence, uh, basically, which is America. And, <laughs> To, to, to be frank, if we are, America is effectively paying for NATO, and we are a very small contributor into that, and that is very concerning. Um, what do we end up doing about it? Well, let's work with our partners on a long-term trajectory to remove all types of uh, weapons, and the only way to do that, as I said earlier, on, is by negotiation, and Britain has got a very, very strong part to play on that journey. Chris Lemberg, back. Christopher Noble, uh, I, want to remember, I want to remind us that we're not talking about tanks and soldiers and machine guns. We're talking about nu nuclear weapons, um, which, which have been mentioned, but in a rather by the way. I want to ask, I don't want to ask our panel for an answer from all of them, but I want to ask them if any of them can envisage pressing the button which would destroy Bristol, or destroy Manchester, or destroy Birmingham, or destroy <coughs> Kiev. Is that at all possible? And if so, why and when would you do it? Uh, well, no, I couldn't envisage doing that, and that's large, largely because there would never, there would never actually be a need for that to happen. And obviously, that, that's the idea of a deterrent: is the fact that it would never get to that stage. So, I suppose in many ways that means the idea of, of uh, nuclear weapons is, is fundamentally flawed. I mean, I personally am a multilateralist. I want to see a world free of nuclear weapons. I believe it's vital that we use our position within the international community to achieve that. I do believe it's a realistic target. I do believe it's something with the right approach that we can achieve. And in fact, what I believe we should be doing, and this is something we haven't been doing up to this point, is actually leading the fight to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons and to achieve a world whereby um, where you know where where we can apply a multilateral solution. Um, well, the short answer is no. Um, sadly, I think the planners uh, beat beat us in those times you mentioned in terms of uh, dissolving and destroying them. Um, but this touches it because this isn't for me. Isn't just about nuclear power, and it touches on something that I suspect will be a theme across the whole evening. Um, it's hard power. Excuse my accent. Hard power versus soft power. Um, and it came up earlier with the question around NATO and the EU. NATO represents hard power. It represents people pointing guns at each other and demanding that things happen. Um, NATO has done a great job to maintain peace in Europe. But please let's not underestimate the role that the EU has also played. And it's soft power. 30 to 40 years ago, we had military junta's in Greece, in Spain, and in Portugal, and partly because of the process of people wanting to join the European Union, only part of it, we now have thriving democracies, they have their troubles, don't we, here in our country as well. We now have thriving democracies in those countries. So let's not underestimate what you can do with soft power. And 100 years ago, Britain was the biggest kid in the playground. No doubt about that, we were the most powerful country with the biggest economy, and arguably the world's most important city. None of those things are accurate valid anymore. Our power is declining, but what we do have is fantastic soft power. Our culture, our language, there are people around the world who want to come to this country to study here, to work here, to learn here. We have immense power to influence what goes on in the world without having to lift a gun. So let's move on from the idea that only can you stop conflict, only can you address issues through hard power and let's think cleverly about what we can do for soft power, because we will never be the biggest kid 
in the playground ever again, but we certainly can be one of the biggest kids when it comes to soft power. From the chair, I want to comment that of course conflict is not necessarily a bad thing, it's a violence, which is the bad thing. Um, I'd like to say that I think NATO has been an absolute disaster and we should have got rid of it at the time that the Cold War ended. I'd never have had a NATO in the first place, but certainly at that point, that was an opportunity missed, and it's because we've been circled. Russia and isolated Russia and built up NATO with the former Russian influence countries that we've got what we've got at the moment in the Ukraine a, a real fear of a return to the Cold War and, and everything that goes with that. So I think it's a disaster. I also think it's a disaster that we think that we should have more power than other countries because we've got nuclear weapons. A place on the Security Council. What kind of UN is that that privileges nuclear powers? Why doesn't everybody get bombs then? They want privileges too. It's really anti-democratic. It's an utterly anti-democratic principle. And I'd like to know from any of the parties who's got a plan for demilitarization global demilitarization. I'd like to hear about that because the military, along with global warming and all the things that are going to go with that, is one of the biggest threats to humanity. We've got plenty of threats, but that's a big one. So what are we going to do to promote demilitarization? I'd like to all It's in about two minutes each, if you wouldn't mind, and we'll start with... Ben, um, is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Two minutes. You said you're an expert in security policy, now I know why. <laughs> um, can I just ask, it was a follow-up question, I hope this intended to come out by two minutes. You know when you laughed uh, earlier on? I'm just, sorry. No, 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 sorry. I, I won't take offence at all. Right. Was it in relation to the fact that the US are funding the UK's defence? I know it's true, but right, that's okay. why we talk about our independent deterrent. And it is Sure, sure. So I just wanted to ask that question. I agree um, with you. <clears throat> right. Okay. I mean, in terms of NATO, at the moment, in an ideal world, we would be in a circumstance where we would demilitarise the entirety of the world. However, we know that, at, as it stands, that is simply not going to be the case. We can work for it, absolutely. We can push for that at an international level, and our diplomats are doing that every single day. And the work that we well, I hope they are. That's their main agenda, really. That's their main plan of being in existence. They're there to talk out solutions to conflicts around the rest of the world. And they've been doing that amazingly well for a long period of time. Um, I think that's Britain's place in the world. If we're looking for what Britain's place in the world is going to be in the future, it is about not necessarily using our weapons overseas. I think the legacy of what Tony Blair did has ended up destroying any possibility of liberal interventionism um, in the future. And I'm very pleased about that, by the way. Uh, one of the few people in the Conservative Party that would have voted against, funnily enough, what Don Foster ended up voting for, by the way. So uh, that's my particular agenda on that. In terms of NATO, at the moment, Bath uh, and Bath businesses are working very hard over in the eastern uh, Baltic countries in order to militarise them. There's absolutely no doubt about that, and that is what they are doing. That is creating jobs and employment here in this city. Uh, it is, by the way, there are companies here which are doing that, I have to say. So we've got to balance, um, not just when we've been talking about, absolutely I agree with things like uh, make sure climate change is high on the agenda, but we've obviously got to also balance out the fact that if we end up reducing the amount of defence capabilities in the country, reducing the amount of investment and jobs in this uh, country uh, on defence, then we've also got to replace them with something else. And then we concentrate on the main issue of the day, which is ensuring we have a green economy in order to replace those jobs. A bit sharper than that, folks. Um, okay. Um, as, as I said, actually, as a party, we we, we uh, would get rid of, we would leave NATO. Um, I don't know if you saw the news this week, but actually, we've been uh, we've had our knuckles wrapped because you know, they are demanding more money. Uh, NATO demands that nations spend two percent of their GDP on, on military uh, spending. We spend less, so we've been told we must spend more on the military by um, by basically not either, and not people we elected. Uh, I think that's terrible. I don't think we need to. Um, 
So what would we do to demilitarize? Well, we would scrap all the bits of the civil service that are purely funding our arms industry, uh, which is massively subsidized by a taxpayer. Um, we don't need it. There, we, there, will be need, there will need to be an arms industry as long as you have uh, the need for a defensive capability, but we don't see that as a necessarily great thing to have. Um, we wouldn't mind a small arms industry, but you know it's not a big deal. We don't think it should be subsidized. Um, we would also make a lot of our army, while we do need an army for some defence work, it would be mostly uh, allocated to international rescue efforts and rebuilding in disaster zones. We would massively would retrain most of the army to act in that capacity. So the hardware and the bases and the personnel we do have, we're not talking about making those people redundant, we're talking about making them a force for good, uh, where they can fly to places where there's earthquakes or other natural disasters. Okay, All right, that's it, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think there's the, uh, we've heard a little bit um, about how the European Union has supposedly brought us um, peace, but if you look at the situation um, in the Ukraine and the fact that we've had um, you know, Russian aircraft flying over um, our waters, um, you know, I, I think we, we, we are finding ourselves in a situation where the European Union is, is effectively sort of prodding this big Russian bear with a big stick. And I suppose we're going to have to wait and see what the, um, what the results are for that. They're not going to be particularly good. You know, part of it we're discussing you know, yet more, um, pretend, you know, talking about arming or military action, um, which is you know, absolutely certain to be futile yet again. But in terms of the demilitarisation, um, I think, you know, in my opinion, is that our own country needs to maintain a, um, you know, a funded and functional defence force. And um, but you know, like Dominic says, you know, with, with the with the role of that, you know, if you have a, a you know, military capability that isn't exhausted because they are you know, continually fighting um, foreign wars, then um, of course, what are those soldiers going to do? And they, they, they can, in many cases, do very positive things. You know, when I speak to people in the military, um, some of them are completely exhausted. You know, our forces don't have the capability to go off. And, and do good things around the world because they are um, stretched, you know, on endless tours in these in these, in these foreign wars. And I think in terms of global demilitarisation, um, you know, the truth is, what influence can we, can we truly, truly have over that situation? We may have big ambitions, but us as our country, we've heard from Ben how we are this <coughs> small, isolated nation um, um, that seems to be diminishing in power and. You know, Really, let's be realistic. Um, first of all, just a quick word on the EU. I, I think it's very unfair to blame the European Union um, for the conflict in Ukraine. And <laughs> not the EU. An imperialistic foreign policy, which is which is uh, which is the approach from Russia that was in Russia. But I, I do I do I just want to say that actually we have got a lot to thank the EU for with regards um, to peace in Europe and a lot of that is a result of, um, of mutual values, goals and bonds and we should be doing more to strengthen that relationship. Um, but how do we promote demilitarisation, which is something that we all want? Um, well working within the context of the international community is vital. Um, it's also important to obviously point out the military force is not always um, negative as, as Dominic alluded to. Obviously peacekeeping forces in the past have done a lot to mitigate the impacts of some of the most violent um, conflicts. It's also vital that we learn the lessons of the past. Obviously, Iraq was an example of a completely um, failed intervention. And you know, an example of that is Syria. Well, the reason that we're not in Syria, and arguably the reason the Americans aren't in Syria, is a result of Ed Miliband and the Labour Party. And that's something I'm very proud of. Um, and we've also got to look at alternative ways of asserting um, power and, and using power on the international stage as a force for good. An example of that is economic power and obviously um, a recent example of that is, is Ukraine um, and the conflict that exists between Ukraine and Russia and our use of economic sanctions. And I think that that's far more than what we should, we should be looking at with regards to achieving a demilitarised um, world and uh, achieving an all-round safer world. Two separate things I'd like to address. Very firstly, on Russia, uh, I, I agree as well that it is not the EU's fault for how Russia has reacted. It is not for Russia to tell the Baltic states 
or Ukraine or any other independent sovereign nation who that nation should choose to ally itself with and why. It is simply not Russia's business to tell their neighbours what to do. That stopped in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union and I'm one glad that it did. Now what is causing problems in Russia? Well Russia has really deep fundamental problems. It has an ageing population. It has a fast declining population. It is an economy that is smaller than the UK's and is increasingly getting smaller. It is an economy that is extremely reliant on petrochemicals and nothing else. And most importantly of all, it has an extremely bellicose leader who uses conflict to embellish his own position and to hark back to his KGB days when, uh, when the Soviet Union was, to use the phrase I used earlier, the biggest kid in the playground. So three things very quickly on Russia. Firstly, we need to remember at all times, Russia needs us, I mean the EU, more than we need them. The EU is Russia's biggest trading partner, they're only our third biggest. They export twice as much to us than we export to them. Um, the biggest foreign investor in Russia, 75% of all foreign investment in Russia is the EU. They need us more than we need them. Secondly, I absolutely believe sanctions with the appropriate time will work in Russia. And I can't see any alternative that will work, and certainly not military power. And thirdly, we have to break free from dependence on Russian energy. The majority of their exports to anybody is energy. 63% of the EU's oil comes from Russia, 65% is gas. I don't believe the solution is fracking. I believe the solution is renewables and demand reduction in this country, but we have to break free from Russian oil and gas, and that's important to this whole situation we're getting embroiled with Russia. Very briefly, how do we demilitarize? Um, I think we just, the simple answer, the simple answer is to get to a situation where the thought of taking military action against another nation is just utterly unfathomable. There was a time, and it was a long time ago, when England and Scotland used to go to war. That would seem utterly unfathomable. Seventy years ago, Britain and, uh, Britain and Germany, or Germany and France went to war. Now, that would seem utterly unfathomable. So how do we do that? By tying the world together more closely through trade, through international organisations, by working internationally, um, by addressing underlying grievances where conflict do exist. I take it back to what I said at the very beginning, conflict, conflict does not exist in a vacuum. There are always underlying reasons. I think democracy as well as a helpful bulwark. And finally, by, by ensuring that every wakes up to the real challenge we face, which is not military conflict, but is climate change. And we all need to work together to address that. Whilst I'm not representing um, a political party that has a manifesto on how they're going to do it, as I mentioned in my opening speech, I will have the freedom in Parliament to be able to vote for what is right for the people of Bath and what your views are and be your true representative without being uh, whipped. Um, and I just want to come back on what Ben said because Ben, at the end of the day, you are representing a political party, and in 2010, David Cameron did say he was committed to a full replacement for Trident nuclear weapons. And um, Sir Mark Rifkind, a uh, very famous Sir Mark Rifkind, um, in two, only in 2014 said, although the final decision to renew the UK's nuclear deterrent is not due to be taken until 2016 during the next parliament, it was during this previous parliament that the lengthy process of authorising and establishing the process of, new, of renewal was initiated. So I ha do have grave concerns that some of our parties are really, um, representatives, are really not going to, to be your voice in Parliament, and it just worries me this evening. I agree we need military, we need them for the defence of our country, um, but we do not need to have uh, nuclear weapons. Um, again, ministers have argued, and, and I've researched this, that nuclear submarines permanently patrolling our waters has served as well. But has our security really been greater than other nations that have chosen not to spend billions on a permanent flotilla of nuclear submarines? And, you know, do we sleep safer in our beds because of it? So, at the end of the day, we do need our military support for defence, for peacekeeping. And the UK, you might say that we are a small nation, but we still have a big voice internationally, and that's the voice that we have to go out representing our citizens and our citizens' views. And as I said in my opening speech, more and more people are against nuclear weapons or against Trident. And this is the people out there we should be listening to and representing. Thank you.
Okay. Right. Um, I'm probably one with dirty hands here because I came to this city in the late 1960s to put jet engines into warships up at Fox Hill and I worked on nuclear submarines as well. So maybe I'm uh, one of the bad, bad guys. Um, but, but, the fox, uh, <laughs> but let's have a question. Well, I'm just about to. I'm, I like to, to achieve things and try and do things, so I'd like to change the, the tone a bit and stop talking about all this military stuff and say, well, you're going to get rid of Trident, you're going to get rid of all of these armed forces, which is going to leave you a lot of land holdings, like the one at Fox Hill, Lansdowne, Warminster Road, where we can build houses. What I'd like to ask you, candidates here is, can you design for me and build me a £60,000 house on that land holding, mm. please? <laughs> 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 Who would like to that? Yes, Dave, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who Natalie Bennett's builder is, but I certainly like his phone number because he sounds very, very, very Yeah, but you get what you pay for, don't you? Well, <laughs> right. Tim Williams. What use, if any, is democracy in preventing and resolving conflict, and why? Thank you. You do make a very good point, actually, because I think what goes on in Britain is a very interesting example of that. Because I think um, in a lot of the military interventions that have taken place, certainly in my lifetime, um, we have our democratically elected MPs, and I don't think that they represent the views of the British public. I think if in most of these conflicts, I think if, hypothetically speaking, we put them to a national referendum, then I think overwhelmingly that the British people would have voted um, against them. But, you know, that's, uh, there was an event that happened recently, many of you have probably seen it on, uh, on the internet, where there was a conference with the um, ADS, the, the, um, the Aerospace Defence Security Industry, and uh, it was you know, quite a prominent dinner, and we had 40 of our MPs dining and hobnobbing with the um, defence industry. You know, Vince Cable was one of them, and uh, if you look at it on YouTube, you'll see there was quite an interesting protest from, um, from somebody that made it, uh, you know, made it quite interesting. And you know, our MPs and our governments are not representing us. In many cases, they're representing their friends um, in, uh, you know, in the arms industry. And you know, this is one example of how democracy is completely subverted in this country. And you know, the situation with WIPT MPs, as I said earlier, you know, people can stand up here and try and tell you what you want to hear. But when they're a career politician, they will vote how they're told to vote. And um, you know, I, I absolutely think that in terms of democracy, and we can certainly do an awful lot better. Um, my question is directly to Dominic. Um, I think it was you in your opening speech right at the start that said, um, how can, you said, what sane leader would, you know, press the force on any nuclear arms? Um, how do we guarantee that every single leader in this world is sane? And assuming, as I do, that we cannot, why enough would we take away our deterrent? Um, you're right, we, can, we don't know that. Um, and it could be that some leader of some country with nuclear weapons is insane and decides to nuke us or anyone else. Um, but my point really is, even in that situation, what same leader here would launch nuclear weapons? I mean, our weapons are entirely pointless. Either we have preemptive strikes on these nutcase leaders, and we're, we're, then we're the bad guys, or we wait till they nuke us, and then what do we do? We decide to kill billions of their citizens 
in retribution, even though we're already going to die, doesn't make any sense. I, I do see what you're saying, but how can something be rendered useless when it's a deterrent? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not just, it's not just okay. a deterrent. It's not a deterrent. Well, my point is that it's not a deterrent, so nobody would never use it. And, you know, it, the only person who would ever attack us with nuclear weapons is somebody who's unhinged. So no deterrent. Yes, but no deterrent is going to deter them. Ben, thank you. It's not just about having a nuclear capability in order to deter someone, because these unhinged people um, often don't come from states. You know, the idea of Vladimir Putin pressing a button to blow up uh, the United Kingdom is not likely to happen. I However, however, no, 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 it's actually not, the, you, you actually got the right point here, in that uh, when the uh, Soviet Union ended up breaking down, a lot of the nuclear material ended up going missing. So if we are in a world where, you know, there is a heck of a lot of nutters out there, i.e. ISIS being the key nutter uh, we're going to be talking about tonight, then they would not stop to get their hands on a nuclear weapon and explode a dirty bomb right in the middle of um, a city centre. And, you know, we would end up with the fallout of that um, and a half-life of sort of 300 odd years without being able to use that particular uh, centre. And then the knock-on effects are going to be huge and a huge centre of population. Dirty bombs are being continually found and threats about dirty bombs are continually being found, most of them we don't know about because they hit the press for obvious reasons. But they are. And the fact is, if we end up completely at the moment, lovely as we've all been saying, that we'll end up removing nuclear weapons in the long term. In the short term, however, um, you could end up being a circumstance. If we are the first country to say, right, we'll give up our nuclear weapons, then how on earth, how on earth are we even going to be able to turn around to some of these countries and say, right, you don't even dare push the button because we'll do exactly the same thing back at you. That is the point of the terror. I was trying to explain it to um, kids at uh, the, the school uh, uh, conference the other day, it was a climate change conference in front of Steve, and I could not get in into Steve's head uh, what the definition of a deterrent is. So please, Steve, will you this time around, please confirm you understand what a deterrent means. No, we're not going. <laughs> I think the key, key did uh, respond um, overall. Um, well, I was hoping to get an answer in that one. Okay, very briefly. The national security strategy for this country, um, I can just get the quote up and apologies if we're on the paper, says no state currently has both the intent and the capability to threaten the independence or the integrity of the United Kingdom. So we accept that right now, we're not in a situation where we're going to need nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons is all about the maybe, the phrase of what's beyond the hill, we just don't know. Now, I understand absolutely what the term means, but I also understand concepts like assessing risk and proportionality. Um, we often hear that uh, nuclear weapons are an insurance policy. Like any insurance policy, you start off by assessing the risk, and then you decide on what you should do as appropriate. So to cut long story short, for me, Trident is an insurance policy which the premiums are far too high, the level of protection offered isn't needed, and there is an opportunity cost to this. But, you know, you have to balance spending over 100 billion on the lifetime of Trident versus spending that money on other alternatives. It doesn't come free. So I understand deterrent. It would be like having a house at the top of the Himalayas and taking out insurance in case you get flooded. That's what I view Trident as. Yes, that would be a deterrent against the absence of flooding, but you have to think really just how likely is it to happen. really, but it's uh, something that's been raised by a couple of people on the panel, in particular Dominic and Steve, I think, is the, um, the question of what is terrorism and uh, how we respond to it and all that. Um, the terror bill that's currently going through Parliament, um, basically, um, the, I mean, people will know the details perhaps, but just two things, um, the, te the temporary exclusion orders Render people can render people stateless in their own country for up to two years, and um, breaking a temporary exclusion order can leave you um, facing prison for up to two years, up to ten years. So, so my question is: in in this situation, 
where we have austerity measures being um, forced upon the population and racism and scapegoating has been whipped up in order to deflect the blame onto migrants, how will this terror bill help? I'd quite like everyone to answer it, but I agree there's not much time, so I'll leave it to the chair to discuss. Straight into me, thank you very much. Well, I think in terms of a lot of this anti-terror legislation that we see, often when there is you know, a significant event, our government will come on the television tell us that we need more anti-terror laws. Um, and I think that uh, we've seen an awful lot of anti-terror legislation over the last 10 or 15 years, and it seems as though the threat and danger seems to be getting more and more. And uh, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the measures that our um, present and past governments have brought in, because they are taking away many, many of our personal freedoms. And uh, you know, I think if I was a terrorist, um, I'd consider that I had pretty, you know, created quite a good victory for myself. Great Britain, because we're now living in a very, very different country um, compared to 10 or 15 years ago. And um, the, uh, you know, I think the, the situation that you refer to of kind of trying to whip up, you know, racism and all these you know, sort of things, I think we do, you know, we have to, you know, we have to face the fact that there is a, um, you know, a growing um, sort of extremist Islamic threat. And, and, I, and I believe that our government's actions abroad certainly made that a lot worse. And we, um, I think it's very important that we identify those things, but that we, that we do act in a proportionate, sensible way. You know, we, we need to preserve the, um, you know, you know, our, rights and, our rights and freedoms. We are losing them, which I think is awfully sad. Um, firstly, thank you to the Stop the War Coalition, because you guys were right. You were right there when you stood up against uh, the emergency to stop the Gulf War. Unfortunately, although I think you're wrong in this respect, that one of Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapon. The reason Americans went in and we took along with them is because it was all a myth. There wasn't any weapons of mass destruction. The Americans knew that. And unfortunately, you have to face reality, guys. I'm like Steve, I come from Northern Ireland. Well, I saw a lot of people kill each other. There's nothing to do with nuclear weapons. Absolutely nothing to do with nuclear weapons. The six million who died in Vietnam by the Americans didn't have nuclear weapons. The five million who died in the Congo over the last 20 years didn't have nuclear weapons. They slaughtered each other. That's a hard fact of life. So you guys are right, you agree with what you did, but there's harsh facts and harsh realities here. And I just because of, thank you for putting this on tonight. So, the only person here that seems to have actually genuinely said the keep nuclear weapons is, is, is Julian from UKIP. And I'd like, on behalf of everybody here, could everyone, could I ask everyone on the panel who, if they get elected, which I think was the question from our, the original speaker, if you get elected, will you vote to keep Trident? It's a simple question. And maybe I would like to see a show of hands because there's a bit of wishy washiness going on here. Could you show the everyone here, which of you will vote if the came of comes to a leader, which of you will hands up, will keep nuclear weapons? Good. Just a show of hands. Show of hands and will keep nuclear weapons. So which party will keep nuclear weapons? Which party will keep nuclear weapons? Well, it's, it's no, which, which party will keep nuclear weapons? Sure, can we clarify this? Because there's any clarification. Well, no, you can't do it. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's pretty clear to me. Listen, Chair. People are, people are voting for an MP here, not for a party. An MP, if I'm the MP for Bath, and I'm very clear, I look everybody in the eye, I will not vote to a new trident. Okay, no, then. Right. Some people that live with that. Fair, fair, fair comment. Right. Sort of new Which of okay. you, if elected to be an MP, will vote for Triumph? Which of you, if elected, will vote for Triumph Renewal? Thank you. And who will vote against it? Sorry, I'm not voting. Are we talking about we're talking specifically about trial here. Right. Okay. 
Then to clarify, who would vote to keep nuclear weapons? A nuclear weapon is a different question. I just don't know the Come under control, please, your audience. I'm hopeless chair. I'm getting it wrong. But, <laughs> so, right, the motion before you is <laughs> hands up who would vote to continue to deploy nuclear weapons by Britain? Well done, Julian. Okay, right, hands, hands up who would vote against such a policy? Well, you're abstaining. Are you abstaining? Because my, in my initial speech, it is okay. about what the Okay, right. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Diana Page at the back. <laughs> right. Um, I want to take up one point that Ben made earlier, and that is the question of jobs. Uh, with respect, Ben, it is obscene to suggest that you should make weapons that are going to kill other people in order to keep British work people in jobs. And over, over 40 years ago, Lucas Aerospace shot stewards who were actually working on weapons, produced a wonderful um, template for changing every one of those jobs into making um, items for peace. Every one of those was taken up by a country outside the UK. This country did not take up any of them. And we cannot argue that other people's children should be killed to keep our people in work. Yeah. While I'm on my feet, I want to ask Lorraine a question. Um, you came out this very strongly against Trident, yes. but you also said you would vote for what the people of Bath wanted. First of all, how are you going to find out? <laughs> Secondly, if they come out in favour of Trident, will you then vote for it? It's a very good question because at the end of the day, your member of parliament is there to represent you. They're not there to represent their own views. So I am totally against Trident. And I said that in my opening speech and it was in my first paragraph, I think. But at the end of the day, that's why tonight is so important. That's why tonight we're here to listen as well. Not only to say, we're not here to dictate. For me, independently, I'm here to listen. And as I said, from research has shown that more and more people across this country are against Trident. They're against nuclear weapons. So we should listen. The politicians, the MPs in Parliament should listen to the people. They shouldn't listen to their party policies and, and be witnessed <laughs> to being told how they've got to vote. They have to vote for what the people are saying. And it is, it is a hard question. I've seen it as a 20, 20 years as a councillor. You cannot please everybody all of the time. But you try your best to represent the majority view. And that's all about listening. And I believe that I am a person here as an independent. I can listen and I can take your views into Parliament. And I would vote for the policies <coughs> for all, all areas um, that Parliament vote in on behalf of the residents of Bath and the citizens of Bath. And listening to organisations such as this evening is vitally important, and that's why this meeting is really important this evening. Is that a yes? <laughs> yes. She did say yes. Um, ben wants to answer the accusation about people employed in the arms industry. Absolutely. Whoever becomes the MP for Bath has got a responsibility to ensure continued employment in this city. So you've got 600 jobs at BMT, you've got 5,000 at Airbus, you've got 300 at Cross Engineering, you've got 500 again at Rotor. That's a substantial number of jobs that are employed in the defence industry within Bath, okay? That's a simple nature of fact. It will not be the case that overnight, whoever takes over control of the government, we can live in fantasy land here if you want to, but I'm not, 
uh, going to pull out of uh, NATO tomorrow uh, or after the general election. We're not going to, likelihood is, if Ed Miliband is uh, Prime Minister or David Cameron is the Prime Minister, Trident is likely to be reviewed due to the strategic defence review. That is going to be more than likely the case, okay? So, however, my point earlier on was that actually, if we are, have got thousands upon thousands of jobs in Bath um, that are uh, associated with the defence industry, we need to create alternatives and we need to be looking at a 30 year plan of turning around what Bath looks like in the uh, global race and the South West race, the UK race, whatever that might be. Our plans are quite concrete in the Conservative Party that we would like to see within the next 25 years Bath becoming the creative industry capital of the South West, whereby we use the absolute amazing intellect of the university and the green technology jobs. Um, to build those businesses here in the city so that we can sell our products to the whole of the rest of the world, for goodness sake. But we have to create the opportunities for them to be able to do that. We cannot just turn around tomorrow and say, sorry, we're making 5,000 people redundant overnight. I'm not going to do that. Just very quickly interjecting, because we've had quite a lot of talk this evening um, asking us how we would vote on certain issues. And uh, we obviously had a little bit of confusion with hands that wouldn't go up. But for heaven's sake, you know, let's be realistic. We've been here so many times before, haven't we? Listening to candidates for parties, for whipped parties, that will promise you how they're going to vote. You know, for heaven's sake, go online and check the voting records of your own MP and, and see that, you know, when somebody's a career politician representing, you know, with a, an orange, a red, or a blue rosette on, um, you, you have to look at their party policies. You've been let down before so many times on this on this situation. So let's have some honesty with how people will vote when they get to it. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, let's be clear on the interest first of all before I ask my question. Um, there's been talk about NATO, I was a soldier in NATO, there's been talk about UN peacekeeping forces. I was a member of the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus and I've been in combat. Um, so I do know a bit about defence. My question is, there, is that going to be on ISIS? ISIS is a creation of Western interference within the Middle East. But they exist. The reality, they're killing people that are destabilised in the Middle East and they're creating problems in Europe. What I've asked the panel is, what would you do about ISIS? The ultimate answer is no one really knows what to do about ISIS, to be completely frank. And we are in a world where we're at the very beginning of what we found uh, at the start of the Cold War, in that we don't quite know. We can look in hindsight and think of different types of solutions. The two-stage solution, for example, wouldn't work. We know that. We are going to have to think about different ways that are completely non-Western ways, by the way, about solving this problem. And that's why uh, the government here, as a part of the uh, foreign policy um, uh, strategic reviews, have looked at ways of making sure that we don't go in there, all guns blazing, uh, so to speak, but we actually work with our partners in the Middle East so that they actually are the ones that end up dealing with it. Because if we turn up and say, right, okay, you do it the Western way and we'll try and solve this problem the Western way, all it'll end up doing is wrapping up a huge amount of conflict that we don't actually need and will be counterproductive. So, um, to be frank, Clash of Civilizations would probably be the best book if you want to have a read of it. Um, that's probably the best model to be looking at on day one. Thanks, um, like all these international conflicts, I think really the, the large rich countries like us have to step up to the plate and, and um, form a significant international peacekeeping force which should be on the ground. I don't think we should uh, be bombing people, but I think we should be there stopping people bombing each other. And there will be a cost to that. But really, as you say, this was a, a problem of our making, so it's up to us to stop it. Three things I'd say. Firstly, I mean, in two ways, it was the creation of the West. The problem, the problem uh, with IS. Firstly, we, we uh, had an illegal war. We charged into Iraq, screwed up the country, and swanned off mission accomplished and a big uh, warship with no idea whatsoever for what would happen afterwards. So we sowed the seeds from which IS have sprung. Firstly, second, another another way in which we did it against the Gatto. 
Uh, another way in which we did it is we backed a regime in Iraq which pursued sectarian policies. My God, the UK should have known about this from Northern Ireland. Nouri al-Baliki was forced to stand down as the president of Iraq because the policies of his party and his government were introducing in Iraq created the dissent that allowed ISIS to get into Mosul because of the way they were treating the Sunnis and from there to then expand. So another way in which we basically screwed up in Iraq. And that goes back to something I said right at the very beginning this evening. There's always, I believe, underlying reasons for conflict. We've seen underlying reasons more recently in Iraq were inequality, uh, suppression of, of one sect over another in that country. So, firstly, the most obvious way to deal with issues like this is to take away the fertile breeding ground in which IS can then associate and develop. Um, secondly, I mentioned it earlier, I'll mention it again. I believe that the Arab Israeli conflict, sorry, the Israeli Palestinian conflict is a running sore. It's too easy for anybody who wants to radicalize people, young Islamic men, to point to what's happening in Palestine and say, look, the West doesn't treat you the same and they do it because you're a Muslim. It's just too damn easy to radicalize people until we get a resolution, a peaceful resolution that works for the Israelis and for the Palestinians in that country, I honestly believe we will never remove the threat of Islamic extremism. Um, and then finally, people in Iraq are fundamentally no different to people in this room or people anywhere else. Ordinary people just want a good life with opportunity, with, with freedom, with the ability to bring up their family in peace and to get about their life in peace. And we need to find ways of showing that what we offer can provide that and what IS offers is the absolute opposite to that. So we have to stop sowing seeds for ISIS to end flourishing, remove the propaganda that they deal from, address the running sore of the Arab Israeli conflict, and please let's not go in again and mess up any more countries and walk away, and let's not put in place any more regimes who cause problems rather than solve them. Certainly, you know, you do reap what you sow, and I think IS is certainly partly a result of Western influence in the Middle East region, which has led to a generally destabilised region. Obviously, IS primarily or partly resulted um, through gaining a foothold in Syria, which is obviously the product of an Arab Spring, which was a result of living under a oppressive, tyrannical um, dictator. How do we tackle IS? Will we continue to support um, coalition? Airstrikes, I mean, that's number one, but I, I certainly do think um, that IS pose a, pro um, pose a problem in a variety of ways. And at the moment, you know, we are lacking a coherent um, policy, international policy, and international response to IS. Um, but we've also got to look at how we mitigate the impacts, um, particularly on the victims of war. And I think it's a real shame that obviously um, certain political parties were very quick to look at the possibility. Um, of intervention in the Middle East, in Syria, in Iraq, but yet were very slow to respond to the impacts of the fact that we were only willing to take a handful of refugees. I think it's a real shame. Um, we should be taking more refugees, for example. We've also got to be doing more in the way of humanitarian aid. I think that's vital as well. I think it's really important. I think a lot, of, a lot of it's been covered by the rest of the panellists, but um, I just want to go back to my initial speech at the start where I said that, I mean, I, I know that there's no answer at the moment how, you, how we deal with ISIS, but, but as I mentioned earlier, that in you know, the modern age of, of technology, social media, I think more can be done, more investment could be put into that within the security services. Um, but also joint cooperation with other countries. It, we've seen it this in the last week, we don't have that joint cooperation. Turkey let those three girls come into their country and now we've lost the three girls from, from, from London. But had they been more vigilant, at young, at look, looking at tickets sold and young people coming through, that was so simple that, that could, those girls could have, been, could have been sort of supported and Turkey could have realised um, that these young girls um, were underage. So that's such a simple one. But so more joint cooperation with other countries has to, it, you know, that's vital. And um, and also I think the press also can sometimes be at fault because I think they do they do stir things up. 
um, all the time, and I know it's to sell newspapers, so they've got to get that on the front page. Um, and at the end of the day, they should take some responsibility here as well. They should take some social responsibility, and they should be supporting that the, the country is in, how the, everything is reported, and um, because actually sometimes they can fuel the propaganda as well. Thank you. Well, I think you know the situation in our, with, you know, with ISIS and how we deal with that. Again, you know, if any of us had the solution here, um, then uh, I think that would be a miracle. Um, you know, we have to be aware that we have um, played a massive part in this in bringing this situation about. Um, again, it stems back to what we've been saying. You know, futile foreign wars. Uh, but we don't sometimes know who the good guys and the bad guys are. Um, you know, we, there are people suggesting that we aren't um, troops that would have now become ISIS. So, um, you know, it is imperative, I think, we stop, um, you know, stop getting involved. And I think the, the, the situation we find ourselves in, where we have our own citizens being radicalised and hopping on aeroplanes and disappearing out to these war zones to fight, you know, is, is, is quite extraordinary. You know, we really have brought ourselves to um, you know, a very, very destructive place. And um, you know, I'd love to be able to tell you what the solution was, but I think we really, really have messed it right up. Thank you, dear panel candidates, for coming along and exposing yourself to us. Thank you.